to the actual uh, purpose of today's event, which is for me to tell you a little bit about my journey to Islam and a little bit about my journey after Islam as well, if we are able to uh, be with the permission of Allah. So, we uh, begin uh, at the very beginning. And I'd probably like to, to start the story off with just a little bit of a background as to myself. I was born in a town called Darlington, which is uh, very near. It's not, it's, not, uh, it's not very far away from Middlesbrough. Um, and it sort of sits sort of perhaps in between Middlesbrough and Newcastle. Uh, I was born there. And at the age of about six years old, I moved to Newcastle upon Tyne, and that is where I've pretty much lived for the majority of my, uh, of my life, uh, both as a child and as an adult. Now, in terms of my family background, uh, if I take it first of all from my mother's side, my grandfather on my mother's side was uh, a Jehovah's Witness. He was a very, uh, by all accounts, although I didn't know him very well because he passed away when I was about three years old, um, uh, he was by all accounts quite a staunch Jehovah's Witness, quite, quite strict. And uh, my mother grew up in a family that was involved in the Witnesses. Now, of course, one of the things you have to be aware about Jehovah's Witnesses is that they generally do not subscribe to the belief that Jesus is the Son of God even though they are a Christian denomination, they do not generally believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, and they don't celebrate Christmas. Uh, and they are very active in what we Muslims would term to be dawah, in the sense of going out preaching, uh, trying to convert people, trying to get people to bear witness to their particular brand of Christianity. And my mother was very involved in this at a, a young age. Uh, she would, uh, I believe, give sort of talks, give uh, reminders and things like that in the local gatherings of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they lived quite a strict, uh, quite a strict upbringing in that sense. Um, I must admit that I think that strictness was probably more from my grandfather's side than it was from my grandmother and indeed my mother's side, they were perhaps a little bit more lenient, a little bit more tempted to secretly break the rules when he wasn't looking. They were perhaps a little bit more uh, tempted to break the rules uh, when he wasn't looking, but as for sort of him, he was very staunch. And the reason he died and one of the things you'll be aware of is that Jehovah's Witnesses are very strict on the issue of accepting blood. They don't accept uh, blood, uh, believing in the sanctity of blood mentioned in the Bible. That blood is something sacred and sacrosanct and so it's not allowed for a person to give blood to another person and it's not allowed for people to receive blood. Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was diagnosed with leukemia and he needed to take on blood and he refused uh, his blood uh, transfusion and I'm not sure whether that really led to his death or whether he would have died in any case but the reality is that he did die uh, and in part at least it was because of his religious beliefs in the sense that he refused to have blood they told him that you need to have, you need to, to have blood. Uh, I mean, leukemia is a cancer of the blood, so you need to have blood given to you by somebody else. And he refused that, and perhaps he refused other treatments as well uh, in relation to his religious beliefs. Now that led to my mother, I guess, and my grandmother uh, becoming very distant from the Jehovah's Witnesses, and indeed. I think pretty much immediately after, uh, pretty much immediately uh, after he died, pretty much immediately after he died, they left the Jehovah's Witnesses and they didn't, 
uh, stay with the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, for very long after that. And they became regular uh, Church of England, regular Protestant Christians, um, who very much fell into the same kind of pattern that most Christians do in the UK today. They attribute themselves to Christianity, so if you ask them, what religion are you? They say, I'm Christian, but they don't really go to church. Uh, they go for a wedding or a funeral. Uh, they don't really attend church. They certainly didn't attend church for any sort of Christmas services or Easter services or anything like that. Christmas and Easter became secular, commercial celebrations that had nothing to do with religion. And likewise, you know, they very much attended church for a wedding or for a funeral and nothing more than that. The church did not play any sort of role in their life after the death of my grandfather. Moving over to my father's side, uh, my father's side uh, probably, uh, if we look at it from today, are a little bit more religious. Uh, there is a mixture of Protestant and uh, Protestants and Catholics. Uh, they were traditionally Protestant from the Church of England, but uh, a couple of them reverted to Catholicism. A couple of them reverted to Catholicism, and uh, reverting to Catholicism. Just to make that clear for the Muslims, that's kind of like a Sunni becoming Shia. You know, it's a big deal. Like if one of your children came home and said, "You know, today I've become Shia." That's kind of the, the situation, you know, you're talking about, it's a big, big thing for them. It's a big, big thing for them. So, they, uh, some of them reverted to Catholicism, and I think they reverted to Catholicism usually because of marriage. And you see this a lot with people, you know, when it comes to marriage, People are willing to change their sort of religious beliefs. You get a lot of non-Muslims become Muslim because of marriage. You get a lot of Muslims turn away from Islam because of marriage. And marriage is something that does affect a person's religious beliefs. And so um, my uh, grandmother's side, there were a couple of family members who due to marriage became Catholic. So there was a mixture there. But one of the things you have to say about the Catholics, for all of the... Uh, the shift that they have and all of the partnerships and polytheism that they have. Uh, one of the things that you can say about the Catholics is they're a little bit more dedicated. You know, at least they will go to Mass on a Sunday, they will go to uh, a Christmas service, they'll go to an Easter service, they'll go, you know, to church. And let's even say they go to church 12 times or 15 times or 20 times a year. But they had a link with the church, there was some sort of religion there. Whereas the, the Church of England guys, in all honesty, uh, you know, there's very, very little, very, very, very little that we would, uh, you know, we would see them doing. And I certainly wasn't brought up in a very Christian environment, um, very much a, you know, a, a secular sort of environment, a very secular upbringing, a belief, you know, I don't think my parents instructed me to believe in God, and I don't think my parents ever rejected God, they simply didn't think that God had a very big role to play in their life. So for them, it's not that uh, they are against God, they're not like these million militant atheists, you know, like the, the Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens kind of militant atheism, uh, an extreme atheism of sort of, we have to go out and preach to people that there is no God, nor were they people who God played a really big role in their lives. So. You see them, you know, sort of not really, uh, not really engaged very much in religion. But I don't think that they religion. I mean, I went to church the odd time. Um, I remember I, uh, in my sort of um, early teens, I became very good friends with a person who was from Trinidad, and of course the uh, the Trinidadians are. Uh, people who generally are a little bit more religiously observant. And so they, you know, would go to sort of Sunday school. And Sunday school is kind of the Christian madrasa. Again, I sometimes have to translate some of these terms for the Muslims. It's kind of a Christian madrasa they have every Sunday. And they sort of teach you Bible studies and, you know, you do sort of activities and sports and things like that. So I went to Sunday school for a while. 
and my grandma probably took me to Sunday school a little bit and uh, my friends who were a bit more religiously inclined so I had, I had some exposure it wasn't that I'd never heard of a Bible before I knew what a Bible was I knew what Christianity was but probably not uh, you know no different to your average uh, sort of kid out on the street it didn't play a big role in my life <clears throat> now fast forwarding the story a little bit to when I became in year eight um, so I would have been 12 13 years old I think that's where I started to um, probably go through the terrible teens and start to, uh, I started to, to, I guess, rebel against authority. I wasn't very happy with, I didn't have a really great relationship with my parents. I just had that sort of, you know, early teenage, if you like, uh, rebellion phase, um, that phase of, of being a, a young teenager, sort of 12, 13 years old, and you know, you want to rebel, you want to make difficulty for people, you want to go against what the norm is, you want to break a few rules, you want to go against a few sort of institutions, for the, you know, as, as young kids do. Um, I don't know, maybe my parents would think I was worse than your average child, or maybe I, maybe I was worse than your average child, I don't know. But I, I definitely had that rebellious streak in me, and I definitely liked to break the rules. I like to, you know, skip the school, miss the school lessons, and, you know, get into trouble at school without doing anything that was really, really evil. But I used to like, you know, to sort of get in trouble at school a lot. Um, and I think that got worse. And of course, the reason for this is the reason that is mentioned in the Sunnah, the statements and the actions, the description, the approval of the Prophet Muhammad the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, uh, in which he said that a person is upon the religion of your close friend. So let one of you look who he takes as a close friend. And that's the reality. I was doing nothing different than following the religion of my friends. I.e. my friends were rebellious, they were rude, they didn't have a good relationship with their parents, they used to commit petty crime. I'm not talking about something serious, but you know, uh, petty crime like vandalism and you know, like smashing things and setting things on fire that was what they like to do and a person ends up following exactly what their friends do so i ended up following the same that they did now we weren't the same academically i was doing a lot better in school than they were but i you know out of a desire to fit in peer pressure maybe a little bit of you know rebellion in myself that i had that mentality of really getting into trouble all the time. You know, I made things very difficult for my parents. I would always be in small amounts of trouble with something or other. Doing very well at school, academically, top grades, top of the class, but getting into a lot of trouble along the way, a lot of sort of little things, and I think it got worse and it got worse. And I'll give you an example. I remember my friends uh, started smoking. And I hated smoking. I mean, until this day, I hate smoking. I think it's an absolutely filthy and disgusting habit. And I hated it right then. So it wasn't something that I was interested in. But I wanted to have a, I wanted to rebel. I wanted to have a bit of a, you know, to break a few rules. And so, you know, I remember coming home with a packet of cigarettes. And of course, I had no intention of doing anything with them. But again, the idea was to get a reaction out of my parents to show my parents that I was rebelling against them, that I was breaking the law, breaking the rules, you know, doing something that was, you know, my friends thought was cool, my friends thought it was interesting. I wasn't really interested, but I wanted to break the rules. I wanted to rebel. I wanted to sort of cause a bit of havoc. And of course that, you know, the more that I did, it didn't help the situation. And it got so bad that I actually ran away from home. Again, I didn't run away from home because I was desperately unhappy at home and I didn't run away from home uh, because I couldn't handle it there. I ran away from home simply just to do something that my friends told me to do and something that um, would sort of cause a big reaction, maybe make a name for myself. Uh, so I ran away from home, I ran away to, I got on a train and I got to York and I phoned my parents and came back. So I was, you know, in that kind of very difficult phase, made things very difficult for my parents. But of course, this kind of lifestyle, it does 
had its toll on you. You know, and it had its toll on me. You know, it had, no doubt, it had a massive impact on me. I started to become very down, very depressed, because I had a bad relationship with my parents, I had a bad relationship at school. My friends, I mean, honestly, we would have cut off each other's fingers if it got us somewhere. You know, we had no love for each other at all. There were, forget friendship, there was not even the most minimum amount. It was a matter of who can leave the other one, who can get the other one in trouble. Whenever we would get together, whoever was absent, we would backbite him, we would slander him, we would get him into trouble. You know, one of us would break something or set something on fire and then blame it on the other one. It was a, a really, really horrible, you know, just a, there was no friendship at all, no friendship, no care. Nobody cared about anyone else. Fights with each other, leaving each other. You know, we used to take pride in going somewhere far and leaving one person and running off. So that, that person got stuck without any way to get home. This is something that they, you know, they, they used to love to do. It happened to me, it happened to them. We all, you know, like sort of uh, took it in turns to play these tricks upon each other. And it left a really bad taste in the mouth. You know, it left a really difficult time. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I probably should have been the model student, you know, the guy who's, uh, you know, just getting all the good grades and he's really, you know, you know, mommy's boy sort of making his mom happy and his dad happy and getting the good grades and going on to be, I don't know, doctor or something like that. You know, that was the kind of thing that, that I sort of should have been doing. But in reality, what I was doing was ruining my life. And I was ruining my life day by day by day. And I knew I was ruining my life. You know, everyone could see it. You know, and at the end of the day, some of my friends, I've since heard, went to prison for big crimes. You know, some of these guys I was involved with, they ended up serving some serious time in prison because they just kept on getting worse. And I knew they were getting worse and I knew I was getting worse, but I was blessed with the ability to pull myself out of it before it got too bad. Because I really didn't get involved in the worst stuff, but you know, how long was it going to be before somebody got a knife and stabbed somebody, somebody started getting involved in heavy drugs, somebody started getting involved in really bad crime, uh, robberies and stuff. It wasn't going to be that long. At the end of the day, these were young, delinquent kids who were literally on a road to just ruining their life. And the fact is, we were, it's a blessing that we were young. Because if we'd been a bit older, it could have been a lot worse. The reality is we were young and we didn't get involved in that much, but these guys went on to do all sorts of things. They went on to a lot of, uh, a lot of crime, and they went on to serving prison sentences, and they went on to a real rough life. So, you know, at the end of the day, that was where things were going. And that took its toll on me. It made me feel very down. Uh, I started to get very depressed. Um, I probably got grounded. I don't remember, but I probably got grounded a few times, and that led to me spending more time at home. I think one way or the other, you know, there were, there were factors that led me to sort of become drawn into myself. I spent a lot of time reading because I used to live a double life. I mean, I used to, I, there's no doubt that I used to live a complete double life. At home, I was the bookworm. I never had my head out of a book. I didn't like watching TV because uh, I was never interested in TV. Even my mom said as a child, you know, young child, I did not like to sit in front of the TV. I liked to be re read to. I liked to read books. And that's what I used to do. And then I used to go out as though I'd been, you know, watching these really, you know, bad uh, sort of movies and films and I'd been, you know, doing all this stuff. But in reality, I'd been at home reading a book. You know, I was leading a, leading a double life. To my friends, I was this sort of, you know, rough kid who was trying to, you know, sort of get involved with them. And to, in my home, I was just, you know, your average sort of nerdy bookworm, you know, who would just go home and read a, would rather read a book than get into trouble. And so this double life, you know, it did lead to me spending a lot of time at home, a lot of time reading. And I think one of the great blessings that Allah blessed me with is that I was able to move school because in, in, um, in Newcastle, and I don't know if this is true in Birmingham, in Newcastle, at least we used to have a three-tier school system. <coughs> primary, middle, and secondary. So middle took us up to year eight, and from year eight to year nine, we went to high school. So we sort of had primary, middle, and high. And so it was at that time that I was going through this rough time that I moved to high school. And that did improve things a lot because it meant a break with the old friends, an introduction to some new friends. And while I don't think I, I jumped out of it instantly, it was always clear for me 
from the day that we went to high school that our paths with the old friends, you know, they were splitting apart. I was seeing them, but much less. We were meeting much less. They were off getting, you know, into much worse things. And really, I just peeled off and we went our different ways. And that led me really to, I guess, a difficult time of questioning myself, asking myself, what am I doing here? Why is this happening to me? I continued to get into to trouble at school. I continued to have um, run-ins with teachers. All the way up, I think I had run-ins with teachers all the way till I was about 18. You know I mean, I had, I had plenty of uh, sort of you know, trouble at school, but little things really. Um, I was never in any real danger of being expelled or anything like that. But you know, school came, and uh, at that time, I guess I started reading more. I spent more time at home, and uh, that led me to read a little bit about religion. And I think I had read quite a bit about religion uh, by the time I was sort of in year nine, coming to year 10, I'd read quite a lot about religion. And I think my first exposure to religion, organized religion, I mean, other than my family, was probably in year eight, when I had a, a, a religious education teacher called Mike Beswick. And I was very close to Mike, actually, and I, I met him even met, I met him several times after I, I graduated the school. Uh, and he, very unfortunately, I heard that he, he committed suicide. But he was a very, very, very inspirational person in the sense that he was very much a, a he, he loved religion. He was an RE teacher, but he wasn't an RE teacher for the sake of teaching. He loved religion. You know, for him, he loved every religion. I mean, I don't think he was particularly pro-Islam, but he, he really did love and respect organized religion. And that was a very different thing for a young child to hear. You know, you're hearing secularism. Religion is a waste of time. What is the point? And then suddenly you're around an individual who thinks religion is great and who loves, you know, like... Even if it was from a very historical point of view, I don't think he himself, I think he might have been a you know, Christian, but he himself I don't think was deeply religious, but he loved the concept of religion and he really showed us, you know, he opened up my mind to the presence of Eastern religions, Buddhism, Hinduism. You know, these are things we never heard of before, Sikhism. And he comes to actually show us, you know, that, that there are people who practice religions in ways that we've never seen before, you know, we could never imagine. And so from there, uh, that really gave us, and he was very, a very emotive, a very uh, passionate teacher, and so that really opened my mind to the presence of other religions. And I suppose he probably was the first person to tell me about Islam, but I don't remember him telling me much about Islam. We used to like the lessons because we still had to watch a lot of videos and not do a lot of work. And so that made us, you know, we did enjoy the lessons, everyone enjoyed them. And uh, I think from there, that was my first exposure to religion. In the gap between year 8 and year 10, I spent a little bit of time reading. And one of the things I think I read, my dad gave me a copy of Sophie's World, which is an introductory book to uh, philosophy. It's a story of a girl called Sophie, surprisingly enough. And uh, this girl basically uh, is taught uh, by a mentor, she's taught about philosophy. And that, of course, introduced me to some questions. Why are we here? Why does this happen to me? Who am I? Uh, how do we know that this world really exists? And all of the philosophical type of you know, questions, and a lot of them relating to what Muslims would call questions of Qadr, questions of the divine decree. Why do things happen to me? Why am I here? Why does evil happen in the world? And so that kind of uh, sort of introduced that to me. And so I was very interested. I won't, I won't deny that I was interested in religion. Likewise, I remember, uh, I remember very clearly that I always believed in God. Now, I wouldn't say I had a very clear concept of who God was. I certainly wouldn't say that I had any sort of religious, clear religious belief. But I did believe in God. Absolutely. I, I never, ever, ever remember in my life calling upon Jesus, ever. Despite the fact that I was a Christian. I never remember calling upon any Christian saint. Never remember calling upon Mary. Absolutely for me, I was uh, very much a person who was 
inclined to monotheism, as in I was very, I very much believed it, that there was one God and one God only. And I remember calling upon God. I remember when I needed something, when I was in a tough time, when the kids or, or you know friends of ours and, and you know us kids we would get into trouble. I remember at that time, I remember very, very clearly at that time, that I would call upon God, I would say, oh God, help me, God, uh, you know, get me out of this problem, uh, give me, you know, when I wanted something, money or some toy or some something or other, I remember saying, oh, you know, God, help me, God, you know, oh God, if you give me this, you know, like, I was very much a person who was inclined towards monotheism without having a particular belief. If you stopped me on the street and asked me, I would have said I was Christian. But I don't think I would have gone any further than that. So here we go into year 9. And I have a RE teacher in year 9 or year 10. Who, as far as I recall, and she is still alive and, uh, uh, alive and well, as far as I know. Her name is Kate Whiting. And uh, she, uh, I recently got in touch with somebody who knew her. She uh, was my RE teacher. I think in year 9 or maybe year 10, it's very difficult, it's a long time ago to remember exactly, but probably in year 9, she was my RE teacher and at some point I remember the first time that she talked to us about Islam. Now generally you're aware the national curriculum at the time was that you have to learn Christianity and one other major world religion, either Judaism or Islam, being the most commonly taught. And we were taught Islam. And I remember she did a bit of comparative religion, comparing Islam, Judaism, Christianity. And all I remember is that whatever I heard about Islam, it was as though something entered into my heart. And I was a very skeptical. You remember, I was extremely anti-authority. I was extremely against any organized religion. If you would have asked me what organized religion was, I would have said organized religion is just how to control the masses, that's it. Organized religion exists to just control people, to just basically give the elite a way to, you know, what they call it, the famous statement, religion is the opium of the masses. The religion is just a drug you give to ordinary people so that they don't bother the elite, and they don't bother the powerful. That was kind of what I believed. However, Hearing about Islam, it wasn't an instant thing. It wasn't that I heard about Islam and the light just switched on, right, I'm going to become Muslim, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah, it didn't work like that. Rather, it was a very slow and, and gradual awakening. And it began probably with the concept of God. And I remember the concept of God being taught to me, and I remember thinking that, wow, no, look at this Islamic concept of God. One God, no partner, no son, no father, no wife, no three faces or two faces or multiple sides or idols or, you know, representations or, you know, sort of um, reincarnation or any of that. You know, literally one supreme, almighty God, all powerful, knows everything, doesn't need anybody. That's it. And this was just a moment of just, wow, wow, what an amazing concept. I mean, if you've ever tried to swallow the Trinity, swallowing the Trinity is like trying to swallow a brick. You know, it's like you, you can try and shove it down as much as you want, but it just doesn't go. It's, it's very, very hard to swallow. There is one God, three gods. They talk about, you know, the apple with the skin and the, and the fruit and the core. And they talk about, you know, the ice and fire, ice and steam and water. And they go around the houses trying to explain this concept of the Trinity, which nobody really understands. And I make a, a very clear point that I don't actually believe there are any Christian ministers or priests who actually really understand the Trinity at all. In reality, the Trinity is just something they believe in. We just believe. We don't have any evidence for it. We don't know why we believe, we just believe. And that for me was, um, it was so refreshing to hear such a clear and such a simple concept of God. How God should be. 
one God, no son, no father, no partner, no wife, no children, no uh, gods that are worshipped besides him, no idols, no worshipping the sun or the moon, direct worship of Almighty God. Very, very simple. That was the first time. But this didn't make me go home and say, let me become Muslim. This didn't make me go home and say, let me become Muslim. This opened up a little door. If you imagine a big heavy door, just opened a, 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 you know, a tiny amount, just the tiniest amount. Then again, off I went, learned some more about Islam, the prayer five times a day. I thought, wow, you know, the thing I hate about Christianity is that there's no link to the religion. I mean, pretty much, Christianity just means that you, you, you have this token statement that you believe in Jesus, but actually, you don't live it, you don't practice it, you don't go to church, you don't pray, you don't do anything, apart from be good to your neighbor, and, uh, you know, be good to your, your sort of friends, and basically that's it, that's all you are. So, you're just good to people, and you don't really go to church. Okay, some Christians may turn around and say, actually, you're being very unfair. And I, I, I'll hold my hands up and say, that's true. You know, there are Christians who do go. But the overwhelming majority of Protestant Christians in the UK don't know where the nearest church is. Or if they know where it is, they certainly don't know what time the services are because they just don't go. And so for me, five times daily prayer, this was like, right, this is serious. This is a religion that takes life seriously. You know, five times a day you're going to talk to your, you know, your God. You're going to talk to your Lord. Five times a day. You know, this is going to make you reach a level of spirituality that just isn't present in any other religion. Other things came. You know, even the issue of the prescribed punishments in Islam. The Islamic penal code. You know, the, the, the stoning of the adulterer and the, you know, killing of the murderer and the, you know, the... the uh, the uh, amputation of the hand for the thief. I heard about these things. I thought it was wonderful. You know, and this shows you that sometimes our mentality with non-Muslims is wrong. We try to conceal things from people, cover them up. Oh no, these things don't exist in Islam. Whereas many non-Muslims, if they hear them, they think, yeah, that's what we should do. You know, in this country, what do they do? They take somebody who murders someone and they give him you know, a handful of years, a handful of years in comfort, you know, basically just a nice hotel, but he just can't leave. You know, and that's what they give him in this country. You know, they take somebody who abuses children and they give them a handful of years in prison. There are many, many non-Muslims who would turn around and say it's about time that we did something with these criminals. And it's about time that people had some sort of fear of committing crime instead of making crime pay as it does at the moment in this country. That actually crime pays and crime is worthwhile for many people because there's just no incentive for them not to do it. So I, was, I thought it was brilliant. I thought, yeah, this sounds great. This sounds like something, you know, it's strict. Now it's not supposed to be carried out every day. It's there as a deterrent. And at the end of the day, if people know there is a deterrent there and they continue to do that, that crime, then they have nobody to blame except themselves. It's the same deterrent that when you're driving down the motorway, you're going to get a three points and a 60 pound fine. If you're speeding, you know about that. If you choose to drive down the motorway driving too fast and you get stopped, you don't blame anybody except yourself because you knew there was a, there was a punishment, you knew there was a penalty, and the penalty came. And the penalty is there to deter you. Maybe a lot of us would say, oh, three points, not a problem. But if, imagine if they gave you you know, banned, you're banned from driving for five years. You know, then suddenly everyone will drive at the speed limit because they're scared. Now, that's not the point is not to talk about speed limits, but the point is to talk about the concept of a deterrent. You know, if the deterrent is not strong enough, nobody is going to be concerned. Nobody's going to be worried about falling into the crime. So I thought it was great. I thought it was fantastic, something very interesting. And again, uh, I went through... Uh, a number of areas of Islam and after a while it just started to dawn upon me and it just started to I guess uh, I started to realize it started to, to sort of uh
become apparent to me that I have become extremely, extremely in favor of Islam. I mean, I wasn't just in favor of Islam, I loved Islam, I loved everything about Islam. And I think that took me a while to realize, but once we started going through, you know, after so many weeks, and everything I hear about Islam, I am just loving it, that feels to me like, hey, you know, you're, you, know you need to think about this as a religion. Because now, you know, you're, you're at a stage where you're so in favor of Islam, why are you not a Muslim? So off I went home and I started to research on the internet. Now, of course, anyone who opens up Google, and I don't think it was Google at that time, but anyone who opens up Google or whatever I did, Yahoo or whatever it was at the time, and types in how do I accept Islam or how do I convert to Islam, and while we're on that topic, you're talking about 80 million searches a month in English on that topic. Google shows somewhere around 80 million searches a month of how do, I, how do I convert to Islam in the English language alone. But that's another topic. Um, I, you know, you type it in, you get a bit of everything. You, know, you get a bit of every sect, every denomination, every group. So off I went and I, uh, you know, sort of read through quite a few of them. And I think there were a few things that I became aware of. I think one of them was the Quran. One of them was the Prophet Muhammad made the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And I think that these two are truly fundamental concepts, truly fundamental uh, under or, or, or principles in Islam. If you accept them, then you pretty much accept everything in Islam. So for me, it was the Quran and it was the Prophet Muhammad May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. So when with regard to the Quran, so I read, Muslims believe this Quran is the word of Allah, divinely revealed. So I'm thinking, okay, that's serious. That's serious, because if it's the word of Allah, I mean, that doesn't leave any room for error. If you said it was divinely inspired, like the gospel, I mean, you have room for error. You know, okay, he didn't get the inspiration just right, or... You know, he was inspired in part of it and then he didn't get inspired in the rest. Or, you know, each person was inspired with what their heart understood the faith to be. That's the case of the Bible. And therefore, it's very easy for you to explain why the Bible is full of contradictions and mistakes. Because each individual wrote what they felt. It isn't something that's designed to be a, a sort of a, a direct revelation of God in the, in the view of the Christians. It's not supposed to be that. All it is, is it's supposed to be simply uh, a collection of inspiration, uh, feelings, historical accounts, stories, a little bit of everything. It's not designed to be an infallible book. Then you have the Muslims come around, they say, this Quran is infallible. It's perfect. It doesn't have a single mistake in it from the first page to the last. Huge thing. This is a book in which there is no doubt. Which author begins a book by saying this is a book that has no mistakes in it? Nobody will be ridiculed. Any author that began with the statement this is a book that is free of error, that author would be ridiculed in a day they would rip it out of the book. They would take the book, rip it to shreds, and just pull every line apart and say, this person was a fool. So I'm thinking, how is it the Quran hasn't had that done to it yet? How is it that someone hasn't gone through this Quran and just picked out all the mistakes and all of the errors and all of the contradictions? And I found some. And I found some uh, Christian missionaries who had made some statements about the Quran. I mean, I'm not saying that nobody has ever critiqued anything from the Qur'an. No, there are Christian missionaries who have made statements about the Qur'an. So I thought, right, that's it, you know, clearly. The Qur'an must be false because here we have contradictions, mistakes. So I started to look through those mistakes, thinking, you know, it's just another organized religion. And what do I find? I find that the mistakes or the contradictions are evaporating. Most of them are just plain lies. They're not even, you know, they're not even intellectual criticism. 
somebody will say yes because in the Quran it says that you can murder your children so if we go looking through the Quran it's not there so I'm starting to get this idea that hold on a second you know these Christian missionaries are just lying they're not even they're not even trying to genuinely find an error they're so scared of the Quran that they're resorting to outright lies they're not resorting to just you know uh, confusions here and there they're just resorting to outright lies I did my thesis in the Islamic University of Medina on Christian missionaries and the science of hadith and a huge chunk of what they say about Islam is just completely made up. It's not even a mistaken understanding, it's not even a mistranslation, it's just made up. Because these people have so little that they can criticize Islam with, they resort to simply just making things up. And I came to the end of these contradictions and thought, in all honesty, these have just increased me in faith. Because every one of them I've read, I've looked at it and I've read the Muslim response. The Muslim response seems very balanced, very clear, and looking at it from an impartial point of view, as in I wasn't a Muslim, I'm not seeing anything there that is justified for the criticism those Christian missionaries were making. And the criticism is so in so few, so few verses, so few passages, that it starts to make you think that they're just basically clutching at straws and trying to pick any little thing so that they can by their beliefs and in reality there isn't anything there so I came to the conclusion the Quran doesn't have any mistakes in it I certainly couldn't find anything that stuck everything they accused was just either complete falsehood or very easily easily explained very easily explained you know, something that the common one they throw at you they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes a day in the Quran as being like a thousand and in another ayah like fifty thousand so i thought okay that's a contradiction either the day is a thousand or either it's fifty thousand so off i go reading it and it's very clear that they're talking about two totally different days that's the context i mean you just have to read read the ayah before read the ayah afterwards it's very clear they're talking about two different days one of them is fifty thousand years long and one of them is a thousand years long and the two are not the same very easy to understand. Again, that is probably the best that the Christian missionary could bring. After that, it all got just down to lies and, and, mis and, and, and misguidance. Likewise, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Again, plenty for the missionaries to say. But what I came across when I read about him is that this is an individual that basically reminds me of Jesus. Peace be upon him. It reminds me very much of Jesus. Very similar behavior, very similar message, very similar, especially if you look at what Jesus actually is quoted as saying in the Bible. Not just what Jesus, uh, if you like, was, uh, uh, was said about him, but what he actually said, you actually find that the, uh, you, when you read the, the, the life of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you find that this is an individual who reminds you a lot of the other prophets. More than that, you find that the message is a message that can only have come from a prophet. Not because of any scientific miracles or anything like that, but simply this. There is no motive for him to have lied. When you look for someone to, admit, to, to claim they're a false prophet, why do people claim they're false prophets for? Why does anybody stand up and say, I am a false prophet? Either they need to misguide somebody for money, for power, for status, for, you know, they need to get something out of it. Or because they're insane. And they, you know, they, they, they've got delusions of grandeur that they're this kind of, you know, that this kind of prophet that has been sent. But you look at the sunnah, the, the life of the prophet, so I said, you don't see any evidence that this individual is insane. Rather, you see every evidence to point that he is incredibly intelligent. And he picks and chooses his situations, and he is incredibly, has incredible foresight, incredible uh, planning, incredible leadership. He's not insane. Okay, so we, he can't be insane now. So that means we're left with 
greedy, selfish, power-hungry. Except that none of those things applied. He had so many opportunities to rule people that he didn't take. The people of Quraysh said to him, we'll make you a king, tone down your message a bit. Just let's, let's have a little bit less of this you know, one God thing. Just tone it down and we'll make you our king. Now if you're power hungry and the most powerful tribe in the whole peninsula agrees to make you their king, why ever would you refuse? Again, when he has opportunities to take advantage for himself, to take money, to take power, to take status, he doesn't take them. He lives in poverty and he dies in poverty despite the fact that many of his companions become very rich. So now we're in trouble because we have an individual who was clearly sane, who was clearly not motivated by greed, who was clearly not motivated by status because he didn't seek that status for himself. And he made statements like, do not exaggerate with regard to me like the children of Israel exaggerated with regard to Jesus, son of Mary. So say that I am the slave of Allah and his messenger. So they point to his marriages. They say, yes, this was a man that was motivated by marriage. <coughs> Let's be honest. Let's look at the women that he married. Only one of them was a virgin. All the rest were divorcees. All the rest were older. All the rest had children. Or the overwhelming majority of them had children from a previous marriage. Are you thinking that somebody who's motivated by women and who has complete authority, he can marry anyone he wants, just points, that's it. And yet he chooses to marry the weak, the oppressed, those who are going through difficulty, those who nobody else would marry, he marries. Again, now we have a problem. Because this whole theory of this, you know, uh, womanizer, this greedy, this power-hungry individual, it's clearly not true. It's not true from a factual point of view. There's no way you can argue it. So then you move away from the man and look at the message. Because at least if the man is perfect, a lot of people claim perfection for men, you know, sort of false prophets. Oh, he was so perfect, he did everything right. Okay, let's just pretend that's the case. There has to be in the message something wrong. The message has to contain something evil, something unclean, something unholy, so that we can argue this message is false. Off we go and look through the message, and the message is very simple. Worship your Lord, don't make any partner with him, be good to your kith and kin, keep good ties with your relatives, treat your parents well, and so on and so forth. Pray, fast, give charity. Where is the part of the message that gives him control? Where is the part of the message that makes him a king among the people? Nothing. There isn't anything. And so you're left with a perfect man and a perfect message. And that leads you to the conclusion that this has to be a perfect religion because you have a perfect book and a perfect man and a perfect message. And so there isn't very much left except for a person to accept that Islam is the truth. And that especially for me when I looked at the relationship between Islam and Christianity and the fact that Islam is nothing but a continuation of the previous religions. Because the one argument you could make is why did God wait until 1400 years ago to reveal the perfect religion? Surely God hasn't been asleep the whole time and he just decided to reveal this perfect religion. Except that Islam doesn't say that. Islam says that from the first day that man was created, they were given this perfect religion and that it was passed from messenger and messenger, from prophet to prophet, until it was the peak of it and the pinnacle of it and the best of it was the last of it. So now you're left again. The argument of the missionary collapses and there's nothing else left that you can argue. You have a perfect message, it's always been there, it's a continuation of Christianity, but it is simply Christianity without the corruption, Christianity without the lies, Christianity without the contradictions. It's Judaism without the negative traits that Judaism has, without the sort of um, 
superiority complex and without all of the other traits that you see in Judaism, without the worship of the rabbis and the monks, without the priesthood, without the papacy, it is literally Islam and Judaism and Christianity, for Islam is what Judaism and Christianity should have been and indeed historically what they were before they were corrupt or corrupted by men. So this for me led me to the conclusion Islam is something true, Islam is something very, uh, you know, it, it's very relevant to our lives and of course this is something that I was particularly important. I mean, for me, okay, it was perfect 1400 years ago. Fine. I agree. I've answered every question. It was perfect 1400 years ago. But what about today? Surely we have moved on. You know what? The, how the secularists, I was reading an article in the Daily Mail today, and um, you know that it was a very good, the first half of the article was very good about how the, uh, the British Empire basically trampled over everything that was Islam and uh, completely abused its position in the Middle East and has been responsible for many of the horrific events that have happened in the Middle East of late. That was very good. But then came the classic secular argument. And we've just moved on beyond religion. You know, we, know, we don't fight crusades anymore. You know, we're no longer Christian. We've just moved on. There is no, now the new religion is atheism. You know, atheism is the new religion. We've just moved on now. You know, we don't want religion. We don't need religion. Leave your religion in the church. Leave your religion in the mosque. Why do you need to bring religion into society? That was the argument. So I thought, this is something that's probably true. Let me have a look at what Islam says. And then you find Muslims living their religion, practicing their religion, breathing their religion. Every single day, wherever they are in the world, they went to space and they prayed. They went to Antarctica and they prayed. They went to the North Pole, they prayed. They covered the whole of the globe from east to west. You find Muslims who are practicing their religion. This is the most practical religion in the world. It's a living religion. It's not a dead. Christianity is like looking at an artifact in a museum. You know, it was dead a long time ago. Let's be honest. Christianity died a long, long time ago. It's dead in the water. You know, there's no way of breathing any life back into Christianity. It is dead. It's a dead religion. The churches are empty. The people don't practice it. Those who even go don't even implement it in their lives. It is a dead religion. It's dead in the water. If you want to see how dead Judaism is, look at the state of Israel which is built upon a secular democracy. And it's a dead, these are dead religions. You know, they're practiced by a handful of zealots. You know, like sort of, it, it's dead. Islam is the only living, breathing, monotheistic religion that people practice every single day. And that for me was the final sort of understanding, the final thing that I needed to say, look, this is it, I'm gonna become Muslim. But of course, I made the decision, I'm going to delay things a little bit delay things a little while. And that was because at 14 years old, I wasn't really in the right place to be accepting a new religion. Uh, my uh, parents, I was worried about them. I was more worried about my friends probably than I was worried about my parents, in all honesty. Uh, so I wasn't really in the position to um, accept a new religion. And I had that classic sort of Western concept that when I become 18 years old, I'll be an adult and then I'll accept Islam when I'm 18. And I went through that for a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of days, I don't know how long it was. Feels like, felt like it was a few weeks. And uh, that really led me, to be honest, to an even worse form of depression. Because in all honesty, you can't live a lie. You can't live a life in which everything that you do is a lie. You believe something, but you don't practice it. You know, it's a belief you've got inside of you, but you don't live it, you don't breathe it. You're just basically hiding your belief like a munafiq. You know, like the hypocrites at the time of Medina who held usually Judaism inside and, and Islam on the outside. It's a horrible way to live. I couldn't live like that. And I remember sitting one night and just thinking, what am I going to do if I die? What am I going to do if God causes me to die? How am I going to you know, justify myself? I've got no way to do it. 
So in the end, I decided I was going to become Muslim. And here comes the introduction to the problem of new Muslims. False information. Genuinely nice Muslims, genuinely helpful Muslims who don't know what they are talking about. And so they confuse the new Muslim. Confusion number one, you need to have two witnesses to bear witness to your Islam. This was a problem for me. Two witnesses, how, when, how am I supposed to find two witnesses? Who am I supposed to go to who is going to be my witness? I mean, I didn't even barely know any Muslims. I knew a couple of friends of mine who were Muslim, that was it. You know, like, I, I didn't really... I had a few Muslim friends. We used to, you know, spend a little bit of time together, but they never gave me any doubt or anything. I mean, I, I was shy to approach them. You don't need any witnesses to bear witness to your Islam at all. You don't need anybody to, to bear witness that you're a Muslim except Allah. But of course, I had in my mind, I was told, wrong information. Big problem with reverts, new Muslims is wrong information. They gave me the wrong info, and then that led to a difficulty for me. So I thought, look, best thing I can do, walked into the living room, said the shahada to my mom and dad. Mom and dad didn't understand anything of it, of course. Uh, said it in Arabic. Told my mom that's just something in Arabic and walked out. That's it. And uh, after that, I concealed my Islam for a few weeks. I probably didn't do a very good job because my mom guessed after a few weeks that I'd become Muslim. And I never still until this day, and I, I must have given this talk a lot of times. Ago. And uh, I, uh, I still, ha until this day, haven't actually sat down with my mom and asked her, Mom, why is it you knew I'd become Muslim? But apparently my mom knew I'd, I'd become Muslim. Uh, maybe I had something open on the computer. Maybe she saw me praying. Maybe I just changed, I don't know. But at the end of the day, she... Uh, she knew, she had an idea, and I told her it's not true. I said, I haven't become Muslim. No, absolutely not. Muslim? What Muslim? Uh, and then, of course, after a very short while, I began by telling my friends, who I was very close to, uh, I told those uh, that I became Muslim. They were very, very helpful. But again, the problem was that they didn't know their religion. They didn't know. And so it was very hard for them to be able to help me. I mean, these are guys who only prayed really in Ramadan and even in Ramadan five times a day. You know, so these are guys that are giving me books. The books are in archaic English. You know, I can't even understand them. It looks like Shakespeare when he had one too many drinks. You know, it's like, it's, it, it's, it doesn't make any sense. And it, the English is archaic. You know, it's very, very hard to read. Don't give people copies of, you know, ancient language English or, you know, may Allah Azza reward our brothers who have translated works from Arabic and from, you know, other languages into English for the benefit of non-Muslims. But I strongly, strongly advise that you do not give a new Muslim or a non-Muslim anything that has been translated from Arabic other than the Quran. Give them works that have been written natively in their language. Because whenever it looks like it's been translated from Arabic, it is like reading something that looks like it was written by somebody who English isn't their first language, and it's very hard to read, it's very hard to understand, and it puts people off. Give people books that have been written in English originally, apart from the Quran, or the Sunnah, or you know, a copy of you know, the, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, or some of the Hadith. But other than that, don't give them a Saudi, for example, Dawah book translated into English. Don't give them uh, an Urdu Dawah book translated into English because it's not written for them and they will not be able to connect to it in the same way. Give them something that has been written natively in their language or at least something that is recognized as being a very high standard in language easy to read, it's easy to understand, it's easy to connect to. So that was a problem for me. And again, you know, the problem you have as a new Muslim is basically, there are a number of problems you have, but once you get over the family issue, and I told my mom and dad, my mom and dad sat me down, 
why, you know, why have you done it? And, you know, my mum, in the end, they came to the conclusion that at the end of the day, you look like you know what you're doing. You haven't been forced or you haven't been, uh, you know, coerced or compelled into becoming Muslim. It's obviously something you've done of your own free will. So they came to sort of accept it with conditions. They said, look, we don't want you preaching to us. We don't want you telling us what to do. We don't want any Islam in the house. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're pretty happy for you to be who it is that you are. The problem that I had is two problems a lot of new Muslims face. If you want to say three, say three. Parents is one, but the two key problems you face practicing Islam as a new Muslim are disagreements or ikhtilaf, disagreeing, different opinions, and sects and groups. Biggest, two biggest problems most new Muslims face in terms of practicing Islam. One is disagreements. Off you go making your wudu. Your wudu. Brother, you should be using two hands. Okay. So I'm a new Muslim. I didn't know. Let me use two hands. Brother, using two hands is a bit It's an innovation. You should be using one hand. To one hand. Brother, wipe your neck in the wudu. Brother, don't wipe your neck in the wudu. By this time, so many people have told you the wudu, you don't even know the order of the limbs you're supposed to wash. Because the people have told you so many different ways of doing it. And everyone, you know, is being sincere. They're not being horrible, they're being sincere. You know, brother, raise your finger in the tashakhud. Brother, raise your finger for that. Brother, move your finger. Brother, don't move your finger. You know, sure, if you want to come and take a knife and cut your fingers off to get yourself out of the khilaf. Because you're in such a difficult situation of people telling you one way or the other. Juan, this is a big mistake. A point one knowledgeable mentor to look after a new Muslim and let them tell them, as long as they don't tell them something that is polytheism, shirk, something that is an innovation openly, as long as they're telling them within the general permissible opinions of Islam, let them learn one way, do not confuse them. Slowly you can educate them. If you see he's not quite moving his finger the right way in the tashahud, let him develop his prayer a little bit, let him grow in his Islam a little bit and give him his advice. Otherwise, this person becomes so confused that they may even turn away from Islam because for them, Islam is one message, one truth. There is no madahib, there is no khilaf, there is no, there is no disagreement, there, is no schools of, there are no schools of thought. There is just Islam. That's all they know. And when you start giving them something else, it starts to hurt their understanding of Islam because for them, Islam is one. It's not many things. And so, give them something, don't give them Anything that is haram, don't give them any polytheism, don't give them any innovation. But as long as the person is being taught generally within that with, with which is, is an acceptable opinion in Islam, don't burden them with too much disagreement and deal with the big issues first. For example, the wiping over the neck is an innovation in the wudu. Whereas the moving of the finger is something that is a genuine disagreement. So deal with the neck before you deal with the finger. You know, at the end of the day, you've got to deal with things in the right order, in the right way, prioritize. You know, subhanAllah, the brother comes in and, you know, maybe he's going to make some mistakes in the first prayer that he prays. Don't leave them. Don't say to him, oh, you, that was perfect, because he's going to learn it wrong. But slowly educate him. Don't crowd around him. Brother, you know what you did? You know, you, you said... Uh, you know, you said Allahu Akbar and you were supposed to say Sami Allahu Liman Hamida and all but he's become just confused. Simplify it, deal with issue by issue, take him aside, you did very well bro, very well done in your prayer, first prayer you did, that's fantastic, amazing, keep going. Well, I'm going to teach you one thing at a time. So the first thing I want to work on is that you shouldn't be, for example, uh, answering, you know, or clicking on your phone in the prayer. That's the first thing I want to work on. Okay, so can we try next time? Yeah, we'll try phones off next time, off we go. So the next time he starts, uh, he turns around and he says, Wa alaykum salam to somebody. You say, bro, mashallah, very, very good. You're trying very hard. Just we need to work on not talking in the prayer. And you give him one issue each time. And not burden him with, you know, all these mistakes. If you're going to give him a book on prayer, make sure you give him a book you've read and it's not full of Arabic terms. The Arabic is not written in Arabic text, it's written in transliteration, because what's he going to do with the Arabic text? It says that I have to read in Rukut, squiggle, 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 squiggle. How is he supposed to read that? 
You don't, you've got to think about what you're giving him. It may be an amazing book. It may be the best book that's ever been written on the Salah. But if it's not good and easy to understand for a new Muslim, it's not, it's not any use. Think about what you're giving them. So this led to me, you know, this disagreement and the sectarianism. You know, <coughs> subhanAllah, you get certain groups, and we all know who they are. They're like parasites. In fact, they're worse than parasites. They're like a rat infestation. You know, these people, they just wait for somebody. They don't give any da'wah. The only da'wah they do is just their own Muslim people. They don't give any da'wah to anybody. But as soon as you give da'wah to somebody, up behind you, brother, you know you should come out with us. Come on, brother, come with us. You know, let's go out in the way of Allah and this and that and the other. So you say to them, Ya Ahwan, yani, you didn't give any da'wah to this individual, but you just come and pinch them. You know, and as a revert, you come there, this guy's this, this guy's this, I'm this belief, I'm this belief, I'm that belief. You get people, and you know, by this time you're thinking, man, have I just left Christianity for the same thing? I just left Catholicism and Protestantism and, you know, Methodist, and I left the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I left all of these people. For what? I left them for one religion, Tawheed, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. I didn't leave them for... Shi'i and this and that and the other and this guy's Sunni whatever and this guy's from this group and this guy's from that group I don't know, you know, you, you, you're lost and you're very naive as a new Muslim you believe everybody, you know, you're a Muslim, wow, you must be amazing you must be an amazing person and so it becomes very confusing again, try to shield them it's not your fault because you're not pushing them into it but try to shield them from it and be harsh against those people from other sects who come and try to pull them away. Be harsh against them. And physically stop them from interfering with these people. Now the advantage is that you have is that when you've given the da'wah, that new Muslim will naturally be closer to you than anybody else. You have that natural link. But you know, you've got to be careful that you don't turn around and the next thing the guy's gone off, you know, to here, there or anywhere because, you know, he's been pulled by somebody else who's given them a false version of Islam. Bear in mind that many of these false versions of Islam are easier to practice. You imagine, you know, you go to a, you know, a nice moderate Sufi gathering, men and women can mix, ladies just uh, a little bit of a hijab, nothing too serious, a little bit of music there, you know, sort of a little bit of remembrance of the soul, you know, like all that sort of stuff going on. It's so easy. It's basically just like you were before. There's no halal, there's no haram, just... You know, everything is nice and free, then you come and you're like, sister, you've got a cover. You know, brother, you can't be sitting next to that girl in the class. You know, you've got to understand that a lot of these sects and groups will make things a lot easier for new Muslims in the sense of they will pretty much just keep them doing exactly what they were doing, uh, but they just have to change their name. You know, so David has to become Dawood. But the same, pretty much the same stuff he was doing. He has to stop worshipping Jesus and start worshipping Abdul Qadir. But at the end of the day, it's pretty much the same thing. He's going from one to another. He's just replacing one saint with another saint. <coughs> and at the end of the day, if the, if the new Muslim is not firmly grounded, that can be tough. You know, I think I pretty much went round every sect that exists. Likewise, do not discount the danger of misguided ideologies, political Islamism, or whatever the term is for it these days, because they also out, they do the same thing. They don't give any dawah to anybody, but they creep up behind them, or you've just become a new Muslim today. Would you like a free ticket to northern Iraq? You know, that's, a, that's the reality of the situation. You know, these people come around, and they don't do any dawah to anybody. They just wait for somebody to become Muslim. You know, I got him. And they fill his head full of, you know, stuff that again, he doesn't have the ability to tell the difference between what's right and wrong. And off he goes, uh, ends up, you know, subhanAllah, falling into something. And the next thing you see him on the 6 o'clock news. You know, subhanAllah, this is something, again, you have to be aware of. You have to be aware that there are people who are seeking to corrupt. The shaitan is lined up for you, Muslim. You know, multiple shayateen from every angle and every belief lined up just to pull this guy away. And he doesn't know anything. Everything he gets told, he just takes. And so it's a big problem. And so it's very much important that you get those foundations in early. They've said la ilaha illallah, do not leave them to their own devices. Get that foundation in early. Get the sunnah in there. Explain to them the basics of Islam. And explain to them that there is disagreement. No point covering it up. You know, not, they sort of like say, well, I, you told me to copy the guy in the prayer. 
But the guy on my right had his hands down by his navel and the guy on my left had his hands on his chest. So which one did I copy? You've got to explain these things. Don't worry. There are some differences. Some differences are important and we have to worry about those. Some are less important. We can learn about those later. The important thing is the truth. The important thing is the sunnah. Instill that into somebody. Don't let them just, uh, you know, sort of like either have the impression there's no disagreement or have the impression that everything is right. Yeah, 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 he's right and he's right. How can it be right to do both? You either put your hands one place or the other, and I don't know of any opinion in any madhab that you put them in both. You know, that wherever you know, put them there, put them there. You either put them one or the other. One is right, one is wrong. So explain to people in a nice, clear way that you will see some differences. Don't worry about those. You can always come back to me. I'm your mentor. I'm your help. I'm there to just guide you through it, help you explain where you might be a little bit lost. Don't allow them to commit sins. When you see him falling into a sin, oh yeah, I'm going out with my girlfriend tonight. You know, say, so, okay, mashallah, have a good time. You know, don't do that because, you, yes, then you're Muslim. Say, okay, all right, you, you have a girlfriend. You know, in Islam, this is something that we don't do. And the reason is X, Y, Z. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, La ta zina, don't come near to uh, performing or to falling into fornication, adultery. Something to do with the honor of Islam. Uh, have you explained to your girlfriend about Islam? Uh, would you like someone, one of our sisters, to sit down with her, have a chat with her? Well, at least make it clear that it's not right. Now that person may not leave it tomorrow, but at least they are aware. If you don't tell them it's wrong, they don't even know. And maybe their level of iman is ready, they're ready to leave it. So actually I don't really like her anyway. You know, I'm ready to leave her. But because you didn't tell them it was wrong, they weren't ready to, to, or they didn't know, and they ended up falling into a lot of uh, confusion uh, and sometimes uh, ended up losing that boost of Iman they got when they accepted Islam. So that's important. Don't let them make mistakes. Uh, explain to them when it's wrong, but don't bombard them with everything and anything. Just keep it simple. Give them good books. You know, you will find good books. New Muslim Guide book and... There are some good books. I don't think there are any books that I have read and I said they are 100% everything in its right. You know, but at the end of the day, there are, there are bet, some books are better than others. And you know, at the end of the day, you, you do your best to give them the best sort of material, videos, links with people. I mean, you can't pass everyone over to somebody because if you passed everybody over, that means someone like me ends up with you know, a thousand new Muslims to deal with and we can't. But at the end of the day, you can, if they're stuck on something you can't answer, pass that question over. Let somebody answer who perhaps is able to give them a better answer. So these all factors led to me really going through a tough time. Now in Newcastle, and I'm only just going to keep you another five minutes or so. In Newcastle, inshallah, uh, in Newcastle we had a particular group of people who were modernist, sort of feminist kind of uh, Muslims, if that's the right word. Um, that they sort of had to sort of took me in for a while um, you know sort of again uh, pretty much causing corruption on the earth in reality uh, you know they caused a lot of breakups in marriages and they were very much you know sort of allowing people to free mix allowing people to you know sort of and, and trying to encourage women to disobey their you know their family members to, to and, and there was all sorts of problems there uh, I left that after a while because of course you know, I mean, I left it pretty much when I saw a woman stand up uh, in front of a group of men and say that you men can't organize anything. And in reality, women should be in charge of the masjid. Men are useless. And then I saw a husband just go, you know, clapping in the front row. And I just thought, I just thought, you know, this person is just risky. You know, he's just very, he's very, very, you know, that's a very sad state of affairs to be in. So that left me for a while. Uh, ended up going through various different groups and, and uh, beliefs and being told this is right, that is right, not finding the true message of Islam. Because I was very clear why I became Muslim, I just explained to you in quite a lot of detail. Um, I was very, very clear why I became Muslim, but I didn't really find that Islam was present with the people that I was learning from. And then of course I met an individual in Regent's Park Masjid when I went for a visit. I met an old man, very old man, white beard, didn't speak very much English, but he did a number of things right. First of all, he saw me wandering around, probably not looking like very much like a Muslim. And I didn't have a beard. I probably didn't have my trousers above my ankles. I was probably wearing, I don't know, 
you know, jeans and a t-shirt or something like that, and I'm walking around the mosque. So he looked at me and probably thought, look, this is either a non-Muslim who's interested in Islam or a new Muslim who's a bit lost. So he grabbed me. He said, can I help you? Broken English, but he, he, he was made himself clear. He said, can I help you with anything? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a new Muslim. I was just looking at the, uh, I think at that time it was the Dar es Salaam bookstore. I don't know if it's still there inside Regis Park Mosque, but it was there and, I, and I, you know, I was looking through a few books. He said, I said, can, he said uh, can I help you with anything? I said, I'm a new Muslim. He said, oh, excellent, come with me, have a sit down, we'll have a chat. So when, and he had some students who were translating for him, they all sat us down, they were very, very hospitable, very, very kind, and more than that, all of the confusion that I had he answered just point by point by point. You know, the same thing of you've got to choose a madhab, you've got to be part of this, you've got to be part of that, all the different groups I've been through, all of that stuff. He just went through it point by point, simplified it, and just went down to the basics, went back to the, the fundamentals of Islam, gave me good books in clear English, gave me good tapes that were well translated, and off I went. You know, and I, and I, I he left a lasting mark, really. Until this day, he left a huge mark on me as an individual. Um, I went back, probably went back to my old life, really. I didn't, again, it wasn't quite a, an instant change. You know, he gave me the book and I just, that was it. From the first page I opened, I started practicing Islam in every single way. You know, I went back to my old ways a little bit. Um, I had a few, you know, sort of sins that I had fallen into, which you do if you're not, if you're not, if you're not purifying yourself you're not praying, you know, there were a lot of things I had to give up of my old lifestyle that I needed really, I should have given, I'd probably given up when I was 14 and gone back to a little bit. So I had to get rid of those. And I actually met some of my old friends at school. And my old friends at school, they were actually doing the same, they'd actually come to the same conclusion that he had. They'd left the sort of sectarianism, they'd left everything for pure Quran and Sunnah. They told me this, I was like, alhamdulillah, you know, they're saying the same thing to me that he said to me. I went back, I read the books, I listened to the tapes, and it just opened my mind to what Islam really was, where I was going wrong, and the fact that the real Islam is the original Islam that was practiced by the Prophet And as for all the, you know, sort of different permutations that have happened in recent years, and these are just nothing more than newly invented matters that were made up by various people because of cultural or political reasons and influences and not real Islam. So I went back to real Islam and that helped me to start practicing, alhamdulillah. And then of course somebody told me about the Islamic University of Medina, said that you can go there, you know, they'll teach you Arabic, they'll teach you Islam. And I mean, I don't think every new Muslim is right to go to the Islamic University of Medina. And I don't think Medina would, uh, it would be very good of us just to ship off every new Muslim to Medina. But it is important to give people the opportunity to actually learn Islam and give them the kind of classes and the kind of framework and the kind of opportunity to learn Islam in an easy way. And that for me is a major aim of the New Muslim Support Project. Uh, and there are many other projects around the world that are doing a very good job in this regard. Just a matter of bringing them all together and making them easy for, uh, for new Muslims to access. So that, for what it's worth, is my... Uh, uh, my story, and uh, I want to give some time now. I'm have a look at, uh, what are we doing? Yeah. Want to give some time uh, now, inshallah. Maybe uh, I don't know. Perhaps we'll, we'll do 20 minutes or half an hour, inshallah, uh, just to chat with any questions and answers that anybody has, uh, any sort of uh, comments or any sort of uh, things that weren't understood, or anything on any topic. You know, issues that. Are, burning issues you've been wanting to ask about, inshallah, uh, we'll, I'm sure the brothers will have some sort of facility for, maybe someone has one of the sisters downstairs contact or one of wives or daughters or whatever, or perhaps the, they can text something through, inshallah, but uh, we'll, we'll start with the brothers, does any of the, any of the brothers who have any questions?